but uh, we're going to go ahead and start. I'm going to ask uh, Craig Cowan to come on up. He, uh, he's back by popular demand. Uh, he, he was asked to come back a couple of years ago, and I'm going to let him uh, tell, you, tell you what he does, and uh, I think you'll enjoy this, but a lot of you may know him. I believe he's local. And so, uh, Craig, you, you introduce yourself. Tell us all about yourself. Good to be here tonight. Uh, like the pastor said, my name is Craig Cowan. Uh, I grew up in this area. I live about a mile over here, back off on the Ivy Hayes Road back in there. Grew up over in there. My grandparents uh, lived back in there. And uh, a few years ago, I got to sing with uh, the Rowdy Mountain Boys. And uh, I had, at home, I, one day I got, I got watching some, some old guy, I don't even remember his name, but he was turkey hunting, and, uh, and he, would, he would get a gobbler to call back to him, it, and it dark, and I said, no, I could do that, and he was hooting like an old owl, and I thought about that, and I got where I could do it, and then after that, I got, you know, the Lord just got it on my heart, and, and I could make all these sounds, and, and uh, asked him, I said, Lord, just give me what you want me to do. And he did. And this is what he gave me, the dog song. All right. I got a little story I want to tell you right quick. Now, I'm not calling anybody a turkey. I have to say that before I start. But a lot of times in life, we're a lot like an old turkey. In Acts chapter 20, verse 29 says, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing a flock. A lot of times in life, that old turkey will get out there walking away from the flock, and it's usually when he gets himself in some kind of trouble. And I can speak the same in my own life. As a Christian, when I get away from God and get away from God's people, that's usually when I get myself in some kind of trouble. As that old turkey is walking in through the woods and scratching leaves and picking at bugs and picking at seeds and gobbling along, <laughs> well, there's an old blue tick hound off down in there. Here's him off there and comes in there and gets to chase him. <laughs> well, he's pushing that turkey along and, and uh, down through that holler, there's a little beagle sitting on a ridge. And Everybody that's ever been around a beagle, you know if they hear another dog barking, he'll drive you crazy. You turn him loose. So that little beagle had to get in there, that old blue tick. <laughs> and the blue tick, he chime in every now and then. Well, they're pushing that old turkey right toward a set of railroad tracks. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Now, we all know that old long black train is the devil. And them dogs are pushing that old turkey right toward a set of railroad tracks, and that old train's coming along. <laughs> Right at the last minute, setting up in the trees, and a wow. Now, when we think about an owl, we think about wisdom, and I think about Romans chapter 16, verse 27, says, To God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Now, if we'll just listen to God to start with, we won't get ourselves in the situations that we do. But if we'll always listen to Him, He's always there to call us back. <laughs> and from Gothenburg, Sweden, to Alto, Georgia, that's called the dog song. Pastors Old Hepzibah Baptist Church in Seneca, South Carolina, right? Seneca, Seneca South Carolina. And uh, the only, I just met him tonight, the only problem that I have with him is that he hangs out with Ricky Bearden. So uh, I hope he picks his songs better than he picks his friends. <laughs> Rick, you know I'm just kidding. But uh, he said he had his banjo in his car, and I said, well, what I want you to do is just get up here and wear it out for a second, okay? Yeah. And then after he plays, I'll introduce Brother Bryant, our speaker tonight, and uh, he'll share from the Word of God. Sean, hit it, brother. I know there's some guitar pickers in here. I picked that guy that won the first prize. I've even played with him, but nobody has a guitar tonight, so I'll just play by myself.
be coming. Uh, we have Brother Bryant Sims. Bryant's an old friend of mine, real old. He's an old man, but uh, he pastors Mount Mariah. Mariah Baptist Church down in Greenwood, the, uh, the flat country down there. And uh, he's also our president-elect of the South Carolina Baptist Convention. And uh, so uh, he is uh, uh, great. We've had him here at Blue Ridge View. For those of you that, that aren't members here, uh, he came and he preached one of the greatest messages I've ever heard uh, on Noah. And uh, we had several great preachers the month that he came. And all my people talked about was Bryant Sims. And so, Bryant, I just want you to come and I want you to share the gospel with us. Welcome. Squirrel hunt. 
outside my house today and I said I did and he said did you set my wife's tree on fire and uh, I said no I don't think I did and he said yeah you, you lit a smoke bomb in the tree and you set my wife's tree on fire and I said oh you saw where I put that out in your driveway you're just messing with me he said no I'm looking at flames shooting 20 feet in the air out of my wife's old uh, tree here so I went over and uh, sure enough the flames were shooting out me and him climbed ladders and we had 12 water hoses you know in the upper hollows of that tree and water and fires pouring out the middle and I said do I need to do something more and he said I think it'll be alright and so we went on and later that night about 2 o'clock in the morning all the hoses melted from the heat that built up inside the tree and flames shooting 20 feet out the top of it again and my buddy calls the volunteer fire department at 2 in the morning on Sunday morning they come out and they say what in the world happened and he says my preacher Bryant Sims and they said are you serious and he said yeah they laid down their water hoses and went back and got their cameras to film the thing and I uh, said the redneck preacher strikes again you know and the next day I made up to his wife at church I said I know you're angry at me I know I've hurt you she said you have I said I wanted to replace what I took from you and she held out her hand and I gave her an acorn I didn't go over real well with her brother Stewart. She wasn't happy. But uh, that tree actually is healthier than it's been in years. We burned every bit of disease and stuff out of that rascal. And it's just as putting on already budding out this year looked great. Then as, as a few months after that, my wife, I don't know why our wives sometimes have to do weird stuff. You know, anybody else's wife do weird stuff? Just stuff they ought not do now. And, and so it was bedtime. And I don't know why. a good idea to go peek out the blinds. I don't want to fool with anything at 11.30 or 12 o'clock at night, so if you don't look, you don't have nothing to fool with. So she went and looked out our blinds that night, and she said there's something with glowing red eyes in the hayfield staring at our bedroom window. And I said, oh, you're just making stuff up. Go to bed. And she said, I can't go to sleep. It's got glowing red eyes. It's staring in our bedroom window. So, of course, I had to get out of bed and go over and look, and sure enough, there was something under a pear tree in the hayfield across the road staring at our bedroom with glowing red eyes. It's about this tall. And she said, what do you think it is? I said, I don't have any idea, but as I stood there and watched it, it crouched down. And when it crouched down, it looked like there were a lot of baby ones around it down there on the ground. And I said, that's the weirdest thing I've ever seen in my life. She said, what are you going to do? I said, well, I'm going to get the spotlight. I had one of these, my mother-in-law. Y'all seen the spotlights? My mother-in-law gave me one with a barrel about that big, and I took it out on the front porch, and I couldn't see it any better, but his eyes were glowing a whole lot brighter, and it was just staring at the house, and it would crouch down, and it would stand up. And it would crouch down, and it would stand up, and I yelled, and I smacked the side of the house a couple of times, you know, trying to scare the thing, and it crouched down and it'd stand up and it crouched down and it'd stand up my wife said what are you going to do now I said well I guess I don't have a choice I'm going to kill the thing you know and I just bought a little 17 caliber rifle and I got it propped up on the column there in front of the porch made her hold the light and I shot it and it crouched down and it stood up I mean I shot it right between the eyes I knew I did it crouched down and stood up I shot it again it crouched down and stood up I shot it the third time it crouched down and stood up took me eight shots to kill that crazy thing. Then my wife said, now what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to go see what it is. Because if it belongs to a neighbor, I'm going to have to do something with it before sun comes up. You know, uh, you have taught me into killing the thing. So I went out there and it was one of these red heart mylar balloons. And it was stuck in the briars at the bottom of the pear tree. And when the wind would blow, it would crouch down. And when it would stop, it would stand up. And when it crouched down, the light hit it different. It looked like a bunch of baby ones around it down there on the ground. And my wife had told everybody in the county by 8 o'clock the next morning that it took me eight shots to kill a red heart mylar balloon, you know. So the legend in Greenwood grows. I'm that redneck preacher, I guess. But that's not the only deal I've had to deal with through my life. Uh, I'm a Baptist preacher's son and a Baptist preacher's grandson. Matter of fact, there are 13 South Carolina Baptist preachers in our family tree. And that doesn't count, that include my brother-in-law, because I don't count him in my family tree. My sister kind of tried to graft him in. But so so that, he makes 14. They're Baptist pre I told people growing up, one like there was a preacher or two in my family tree is like there was a nut behind every bunch of leaves, you know. And uh, everywhere you look.
book, there was one. And my dad pastored, and my granddad pastored up here in upstate. But most of the time, people say, this is Horace's boy for most of my life. And my dad's been with the Lord for 20 years, and they still say that. This is Horace's boy. And uh, everybody where I go, they say, you look just like your daddy. And I don't really understand that because uh, my dad walked with a cane, and I don't. And my dad wore glasses, and I don't. And my dad didn't have a beard, and I do. And so finally one day it dawned on me, you know, that they could only be talking about one other thing. <laughs> and I just told people, say what you're thinking. You got that Sims gut, you know, if that's what you mean. Uh, just go ahead and say it. I always like to clear the air on that, guys. It's not heredity. It's not genetics. It's not even a lack of exercise on my part or anything like that. It's my grandma Sims' fault. And uh, my grandma Sims was one of the best cooks that ever walked the face of the earth. She was. And when you went to her house, you didn't get a meat and two vegetables. You got like five meats and ten vegetables. And they didn't have little round plates. They had these speckled porcelain platters. You know what I'm talking about, those oval platters. And my grandma would pile food on that thing, and she'd put it in front of me. And, and my earliest memory is sitting down at her table on this big mounded plate of food, and she'd tell me, Son, I want you to clean your plate. Just think about starving children in China. Yeah. I worried about those children starving to death in China my whole life. I did. And, and then a few years ago, we were at uh, the, the thing they called at the time, Shepherd in the Shepherd. And, and it was in Savannah, Georgia. And they put us up in the Savannah River Marriott. And it's the fanciest hotel I'd ever been in in all of my life. And, and if I'm honest, I hope I'm never in a hotel that fancy again. And, when I, I went to the bathroom that night to get a shower so I'd be ready to go early the next morning, it was the fanciest bathroom I'd ever seen in my life, too. Guys, when I opened the shower door, the whole back wall of that thing was a mirror. The two ends were mirrored. The back of the door was a mirror. The ceiling was a mirror. And I stood there in that shower that night looking from mirror to mirror, you know? And I was half shocked and half disgusted at what I saw. And I said to myself right there, my word, what is this doing for starving children in China? <laughs> Absolutely nothing. My grandma lied. She did. But I've, tried to, I've been trying to do something about the family resemblance. I'm going to tell you, it's hard work. It's hard work. But two years ago, I started seriously working on it. And I've lost about 115 pounds. I've kept it off so far for two years. But I'm going to tell you what, that's tough. One of the toughest things is just understanding how much weight that was and, and that evidently it hadn't made that much of a difference. I ran into Stewart's father-in-law the other day, one of my dear friends. and he, he, We were at a meeting down in Columbia and he said, Brother Bryant, you look like you've lost a little weight. And I said, I have. And he said, I could really tell it in your face. <laughs> Guys, 115 pounds. I thought, my word, how big was my head, you know? How big was it? And uh, then my son showed me a picture, and it was like a watermelon. It was pretty big. It was pretty big, but I'm working on that. It's not easy. Everybody wants to know, what is the diet where you lost all that weight? This is it. I, I tried a bunch of them. I tried the garlic diet. Has anybody tried that? You eat as much garlic as you can in everything. I didn't lose any weight on the garlic diet, but my wife said I looked smaller from a long distance away. She did. My doctor gave me this new thing they tried. It was a diet inhaler. It's the first one I'd ever seen. It's like an asthma inhaler, but when you got hungry, you took a puff on it. It tastes like Fritos, you know? It made you think you'd eaten a snack, and you could go on. I asked my doctor, what are the results on this thing? He said 50-50. I said, 50-50? He said, yeah, 50% of the people lost weight. I won't tell you which end I came out on that one. So here's the one that works for me. If it tastes good, spit it out. That's it. If it tastes good, just spit it out. Eat all that stuff that doesn't taste good, all, all that you want. And it'll, it'll work a little bit. I have not exercised a whole lot on my diet. I did go, my doctor told me, join a gym, and I did. And I went back to see him, and he said, you joined the gym. And I said, I did. He said, how's it going? I said, it's going fine. He said, well, what do you do when you go? I said, you didn't say anything about going. You just told me to join. He said, unless you go get on that treadmill, son, nothing's ever going to happen. And I, I've got a philosophy about that. I'll gladly share it with you guys. I shared it with my doctor. I said, why would I punish my legs for something that my mouth did? It doesn't make any sense to me at all. It's just dumb, you know. It's just dumb. So 
I've been working on it and I'll continue to work on it. The, uh, the other family resemblance I have to deal with is that I am a preacher and we had all those preachers and, and because we had all those preachers I just wanted to be a good one, you know? Because I'll be honest, with 14 in your family tree, not all of them were good. <laughs> Even a good tree will bear, bear bad fruit sometimes, right? Uh, occasionally, so not all of them were good. I wanted to be a good one. I'm always looking for signs. How do I know if I'm doing a good job? Brother Stewart, I get mixed signals, man. I, the lady, the last church I pastored, when I left to go to Mount Moriah, she said, we'll never be able to replace you. And I said, I'm sure that's not true. I was sure that wasn't true because I was pretty sure she didn't even like me, you know. And uh, So I said, I, I'm sure you will. She said, we didn't even know what sin was before you came here. Oh, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know. I don't know. Just the other day, I preached a revival service down at a little church in Edgefield. And the lady came out after the service and she said, Your sermons mean so much to my husband since he lost his mind. <laughs> it's just not what I was looking for, you know? I, I didn't know. I can't tell. A, a, a few years ago, we built a new building. It was a huge addition for us. It was big, 10,000 square feet. And it's the first new worship space at our church in over 200 years. And uh, we had been meeting in the same sanctuary for 200 years. And so we were getting ready to move into it. And the deacon said, let's do something special. Easter Sunday was the first Sunday. Let's do something special. They said, preacher, get the best preacher in the state to come. And I said, I know him. I'll talk to him. So I went and came back. And I said, I'm sorry, guys. He, he can't make it. And they said, well, if he can't make it, get the smartest preacher in the state. And I said, I know him. I'll call him. And I went and said, guys, he can't make it. And they said, well, if you can't get the best or the smartest, just get the best looking. And I said, well, I know him too. So I went and came back and said, he can't make it. And they said, well, preacher, we don't know what else to do. We reckon we just want you to preach. And I'm going to be honest. I'd already told them no three times, you know. I, I didn't know what else to do. So I just worked extra hard, guys. I put it together and... Uh, I, I preached, I thought it was a jam up message that day, I really did. And the altars were filled and we got in our car to go to my mama's house for dinner and I looked at my wife and I said, baby, how many great preachers do you think there are in the state of South Carolina right now? And she said, one less than what you're thinking, I guarantee you that. So I, uh, I just get mixed signals. And then, and then you have to deal with this when you're a preacher, just try not to say dumb things. I don't know if y'all realize how hard it is for us just not to say something dumb. For instance, one of the dumbest things I ever heard in my life, now some of these younger guys in here won't remember this, but I remember when we first got these things in our church. You remember when we first got these? And every Sunday the preacher would get up, in my case it was my daddy, and he would say, if you can't hear me in the back, would you please raise your hand? Have you ever thought about that? That's dumb. If they can't hear you in the back, how are they going to know to raise their hand? If they raise their hand, they're lying, you know? They, they just lied in church. Who does that? So it was just a dumb thing to say. Or I remember growing up in church when they used to say this, would you all turn over in your hymnal? What if we just did that, you know? Everybody laid their hymnal in the aisle and went at it. I mean, just turned over in them. Or I remember growing up hearing about this, would you pray for all of those who were sick in the bulletin? What in the world kind of disease is that? Sick in the bulletin. I've never been there. I don't ever want to be there, you know. These types of things I grew up hearing guys say. And then when I got to college, I found out that young guys were saying even dumber stuff. We all went to support each other up there in North Greenville when you preached your first sermon. And I had a friend got ready to preach his first sermon and we all went that Sunday and he got up and read the scripture and he was praying and he said, Lord, forgive us for our fallen shorts. And I just don't believe that's what he meant to say, Brother Stewart. <laughs> I, I think I know what he meant, but it is not what he said. And uh, the whole church just chuckled, and it, he was done from that point. I had another friend, he got up, he thought he would one up that guy, I guess. And he read his scripture, and he prayed, and he said, Lord, eliminate my mind. <laughs> he meant to say illuminate. He's trying to use a big word, you know, and he couldn't pull it off. Lord, eliminate my mind. And I can tell you this, everybody that was at that service left believing in the power of answered prayer. <laughs> the rest of that service was right downhill. My brother-in-law, I coached him on his first funeral, and he did a fine job with the funeral, but he got to the end of it, and we didn't talk with him about how to close the service. 
And uh, he got nervous. You could tell he was gripping the pulpit and it was shaking a little bit, you know. And his knuckles were turning white and he put his head down. And then when he lifted his head, you could just see, you know, that he had that illumination my other friend tried to pray for. He thought he knew just the exact thing to say. And he said this. He said, in closing, I'd like to thank everyone who made this funeral possible today. <laughs> That's the type of thing that'll get you uninvited to the graveside, brother, you know? It just will. And, and, and then I had one of those too. I, I, I tried to learn from all of my friends. My first pastor was bivocational, the, the huge metropolis of Calhoun Falls. I pastored First Baptist Church over there. They had 12 people the Sunday they called me. It was the first unanimous vote they'd had in 20 years, and I bet it would have changed the next week if you'd just give them another week with me. Uh, but we, we made it through, and they wanted to have a Christmas Eve candlelight service. Now we didn't have those on the Mill Hill where I grew up down there in Greenwood. And so I had talked to people and find out about it. They told me everybody lights candles and you turn the lights off and you sing some Christmas carols and light a Christmas tree and all this stuff. So I was giving it an old redneck try, you know. And we got to the time of the service and they had passed the flame throughout the everybody's candles were glowing brightly and it was my turn to say something and I got up and I said, now that you're all it, we'll sing Joy to the World. <laughs> Didn't do anything for the reputation of a 22-year-old preacher, I guarantee you. I guarantee you. And my dad never, I mean, he just never stumbled over his words. I, I, I listened to him every Sunday for 20 years of my life. And he never stumbled over his words at my wedding of all places. We got to the part in the ceremony where you exchange rings. And he, we said the words over the ring, you know, and he looked at my wife and he said, you may now put the thing on his ringer. That's what he said. And it got away with him so bad, he cleared his throat. <clears throat> what I meant to say was, you may now put the thing on his ringer. He said it again, you know, right there. And then he just, he just looked at my wife and he said, would you just do it? Would you just do it? So she did she did. And there's one other thing that makes it difficult to be a preacher. And uh, there's a lot of other things. One other thing I want to take time to talk to you guys about tonight. That's baptism. It, it's especially hard when you're a Baptist preacher. Because, I mean, you just take your life in their hands and get in there with them, you know. Now, I'm going I'm to tell the truth. I, I'm, I'm a little bit newfangled on that. When we built our new building, part of it was just practical. A, a baptistry was going to cost us $38,000. And I found online where I could buy a little baptismal pool that rolled out of the storage closet for $2,500. And we went with the $2,500 version, you know. I can fill it up from the hot water heater on Sunday morning. I don't have to heat it up on Saturday night. And I don't have to get wet anymore. I just stand behind it and dump them down there. And I like that. But in our 200-year-old building, it, it wasn't a baptistry like this. It was right here. Under the pulpit. When you got ready to baptize, you had to move the pulpit and pull back the carpet and there were these plywood plates in there and you pulled up the plates and the baptistry was a hole right there in the floor. Well, our church predated indoor plumbing. Thank goodness by the time I got there, we had some indoor plumbing, but they used to have to bring barrels and fill the baptistry up when it was time to baptize. And one of the greatest stories about baptism I've ever heard in my life is told by one of my heroes of the faith. He was an old preacher named Grady Nutt. And some of you guys will know him from Hee Haw, but a lot of guys in here aren't old enough to remember Hee Haw. So y'all won't remember him. Grady Nutt said it was time for baptism at his home church in Texas. And they had a pool like that. It was a little one-room church house. So they didn't have anywhere for people to change. So they hung a sheet this way across the choir loft and another sheet that way. And they had a men's room and a women's room for people to change. So it was Sunday night. And they had two candidates come for baptism. And one of them was Mr. Hawkins, the town drunk. And the other one was Mrs. Middleton, who was a little Methodist woman. that finally seen the light come to the Baptist church to get immersed. And uh, so they got any good Baptist church, shall we gather at the river, they sang. Or, Jordan, Stormy Banks, I stand anything about water. You know, you sing when it's time to baptize. And they had the whole congregation all frothed up for a good baptism. And so the pastor goes into the pool and he takes Mr. Hawkins, the town drunk, by the hand. And Hawkins comes down in there. And the pastor says, on a public profession of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize you, Hawkins. Sploosh. He just 
takes Hawkins down, you know. I don't want to step on somebody's rod tip right there. Sploosh, he just takes old Hawkins down and brings him back up and the, the crowd goes wild and Hawkins goes up here behind the, the sheet schlop. That's his wet shirt hitting the floor. Everybody can hear it, you know. It's just a little one-room church house. And then Mrs. Middleton comes to the steps and pastor takes her by the hand and she gets about two steps deep and she looks at the preacher and she says, I changed my mind. And he said, no, you didn't, you know. And he proceeds to bring her on down about knee deep. And she says, I can't do this. And he said, you've got to do this. And he brings her on down into the pool. And he says, on your public profession of your faith, I baptize you, Middleton. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Well, she locks her knees. And she's like an old cypress stump. She's not going anywhere. The preacher can't budge her. So he does the only thing any self-respecting Baptist preacher in his place would do. He takes his right foot and kicks her legs out from under her, right? And when he does, she's struggling for her life. She's looking for anything she can find to save her life. And there's only one thing within her reach. It's this sheet hanging up across the church. So she grabs it and down it comes. And when it does, Mr. Hawkins standing there drying off. And when he hears everybody laughing, he turns around to see what's so funny, you know? When Mr. Hawkins found out what's so funny, he went in the baptismal pool feet first. And uh, Grady Knight said that Mrs. Middleton rose to the top of the pool and walked across the top of the water all the way back to the Methodist church where she died a dear old Methodist saint. So, I mean, believe it or not, guys, believe it or not, I know all the jokes that we hear and all that stuff. I'm sure you guys tease Stuart a little bit about working one day a week and all that good stuff, but man, it's hard to be a preacher. It's hard to be a preacher. But you don't have to be a preacher to do dumb things either. Just like the uh, setting my, my guy's tree on fire and killing the mylar balloon, there's one other thing that I'm bad at when, when, when it's time for me to get outside. And I am an avid outdoorsman. They all advertise. I, this is my fifth wild game dinner, I think, this spring. And everybody advertises me as an avid outdoorsman. I am. It might not be what you think, but I'm an avid outdoorsman. I, uh, I squirrel hunt two or three times a week during squirrel season. As soon as deer season's over, I've got two or three guys in my church with dogs, and they know what time I'm available in the afternoon. And even if we can only get out there in an hour, there have been a lot of hours this, this past fall that we killed eight to ten squirrels in an hour with a good dog in the right spot. So I love the squirrel hunt. I had not shot a deer in about five years. For five years I've been carrying my kids. I hadn't even carried a rifle. And uh, my, my young'uns were big enough this year that they were both in their own stands and they weren't with me anymore. And so I carried a rifle. I looked at one deer, but I wasn't going to shoot anything unless something massive walked by me, you know uh, but my kids both killed deer again this year, so I do deer hunt a lot. I just haven't killed one in a long time and don't really care if I do or not. I just assume my kids have that opportunity. I am an avid fisherman, but again, it might not be what you think. Uh, I have never owned a boat. I, I've won a lot of big bass tournaments on a lot of big water with a lot of different partners, and I usually outfish my partner when we go, but I've never owned a boat. I learned to fish in these creeks down there in the flatlands where I grew up. Edgefield and McCormick counties, I was just telling somebody earlier, you'd be amazed. You can go in creeks that people would be terrified of. They don't look like they're 12 feet wide, about knee deep, and there are five-pound bass layered all throughout those things that never see a person, except for about once every two or three years when I make my way down that section of the creek fishing. And I caught a lot of big fish out of the creek that a lot of people don't even know exist. When I fish on Greenwood, most often in the spring and summertime, I don't even take a fishing rod because I'm one of those old boys that the most exhilarating thing I can do as soon as the water's warm enough to get in is to stick my hand up under a boat ramp and let a big old catfish clamp on. I love it. I love it. I just can't get enough of it. And uh, so when I get a chance in the spring, I'm ready to go. And uh, we just go, my son thinks it's the dumbest thing he's ever seen in his life. He stays on the pontoon and videos. But we get off barefooted and we walk Greenwood's covered with these little private boat ramps. We take our foot and walk along the edge of that ramp until you find the hole. And you kind of use your foot to make sure it's good and deep. And you locate all of them and we all go down and just run your hand up in the hole. And uh, somebody asked me, somebody always asked me, what does it feel like? It feels like getting your hand slammed in a door. I'm not going to lie. But it is absolutely exhilarating. When you stick
stick your hand in there and you feel a few little old muscle shells, right? That's your first clue. I'm in a good hole if there's muscle shells in there. You feel on around. If you've already had a couple of weeks of warm weather, you feel that slimy egg mass in there. You touch those eggs, you better get ready because you're fixing to get bit, you know. And uh, I mean, it is just a ton of fun. I love to do that stuff. I love, I know I don't look like it. I love to hike. And uh, we, we've probably hiked already since uh, probably the second week of February. Me and my son and some of his friends start hiking waterfalls. And we've probably already hiked 60 or 70 miles so far this year. On the uh, Monday before Easter, we're parking at Oconee State Park. And they're driving us up to uh, Lower Whitewater Falls at the Bad Creek Access. And we're going to walk back by Wednesday. It's about 45 miles in three days. And so me and my son are going to backpack that. And that's just what I love to do. I love to be outside. But one of the reasons I love to hike and one of the reasons I love to squirrel hunt with somebody else and their dog is because if I'm in the woods by myself and there is not a marked trail, I can guarantee you that I'm going to get lost. I just have no sense of direction when I get out there. It is horrible. I've got one of those little things now. What is it? One of those apps, deerstand.com or, or hunttrek.com or something so that when I go off help my kids track a deer, I know I can find my way back to the truck because i got a GPS on me, you know. And uh, we're going to make it back out of there, okay. I have been lost so many times. But one of the worst times I got lost, I wasn't alone, wasn't even in a, in, 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 uh, in a truck. We were in a boat. We put in a, 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 a Calvin Falls State Park. And we started up the lake. They started building something called McCullough State Park years ago. And they ran out of money. And they never finished the park. But they had put in all the roads and uh, picnic shelters and all of this stuff. And then just stopped the thing. And left the project. So we like to get in a boat, go to McCullough State Park, and hunt squirrels. And uh, that particular day, I was with a family called the Sprouse family. We've had some pretty wild adventures together. And they, everybody was related except for me. And so we were in about a 17 and a half foot John boat, a big wide aluminum boat. And we took off and we were squirrel hunting. And we stopped at this one place and got out at McCullough. And two of the Sprouse boys took after a bunch of wild hogs. I don't know how they thought they were going to kill them with 22s. I guess just shoot them enough and follow them long enough till they drop. But they took off after wild hogs. And me and Jay Sprouse took off this way. And we had an adventure in all our own. We wound up killing five raccoons and 26 squirrels while we waited on these other boys to get back from chasing hogs. And a gray fox I killed out of a squirrel nest that day. I looked up and he looked out and I said, Jay, what was that? And he said, I don't know. And I said, well, shoot it because it's going to jump on me, you know. A big old gray fox came out of that nest that day. So they showed up with nothing and we showed up with all of this game. And uh, one of them, no, they didn't show up with nothing. One of them had a nine-foot lighter stump they had drug through the woods. A stob that was all lighter, you know. And they strapped that to the front of the boat and we had all that fur and we stopped one more place to work on a squirrel. And we, smoked, we pulled out a smoke bomb and we smoked him to death in the hole he was in in the tree. And he fell and we were trying to dig him out. And it was getting dark and my friend in the boat said, Hey guys, y'all better come on. I just realized I forgot my spotlight. Now we were on Lake Russell. I don't know how familiar you are with Lake Russell, but there's timber standing everywhere. Everywhere. You don't go on that lake at night without a light. And by the time we got down off of that bluff, we were on to the boat and got in the boat, it was dark. So we started easing on back towards Calhoun Falls State Park and finally we saw a light at a boat ramp and we pulled up and it was Latimer. And that's probably a good 15, 20 minute boat ride from the state park. And uh, I told those boys, we're stopping right here. They said, no, we're going on to state park. I jumped out. It was about 25 degrees in his knee deep water and I jumped out and said, I'm not going any further. And they said, well, what are you going to do? And I said, well, we're going to call a sheriff, you know, and let him help us out on this one. And sure enough, we called him. All the boat ramps were already locked up. It was so late. And so we called the sheriff. He came and unlocked it. And I told him, don't let the boat get too close to the shore because we might need a fur bearer's license with all this game we've got in this boat. You know, we wound up with 39 squirrels on the day. Was in the limit because there were four of us. And we were one within the limit. And we had all those 
got back, but I can remember what a hopeless feeling it was to be lost on that lake. Now, I've been lost some places and knew that I'd eventually get out. I've been in the woods and knew that I could eventually hear the road, you know, that's what we say. You hear cars on the road, but we say you can hear the road. I knew I'd eventually find the road and be able to hitchhike or something back to where I need to get to. But on that lake in the middle of the night, about 25 degrees, we were utterly and hopelessly lost. And I wasn't going any further until we had a way to get out of that. I don't know if there's a more hopeless feeling in the world than when you realize that you're lost. The good news is, Luke chapter 19 verse 10 says this, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. I, I was talking with some guys in my neighborhood the other day. It was some pastor clergy group at the hospital. And you have to go to two meetings a year to uh, keep your clergy credentials there at the Greenwood Hospital. I don't know if y'all have anything like that or not. But guys from a bunch of different denominations and a bunch of different places were in that meeting and they got to talking about some political stuff and this type of stuff. And I was in the minority in the room uh, the viewpoint that I was coming from on some stuff. And I told those guys, I said, you know what? The biggest problem in our country today is that we've got more lost people than we've ever had, I think, before in the history of this country. There are just more people that are lost. And two of those pastors looked at me and they said, what does that mean? Two pastors looked at me and they said, what does that mean? We've heard people say that before, but we, we want you to explain to us what it means for somebody to be lost. And I'm going to tell you the truth, I wasn't really surprised because we know that we live in a day and time where a lot of people don't understand what it means to be lost. You see, when I was lost on the lake that night, or we got, me and my uncle Ronnie, he's from up in this area, Ronnie Sims, we got lost down there in McCormick squirrel hunting one time. Those other times, well, we knew we were lost. We were looking for a way out. What would it be like to be lost and not even know what that means? What would it be like to be lost and there's nobody that's ever going to come looking for you because they don't know that you're lost and you're not anxious, you're not looking for help because you don't even understand that you're lost yourself. So what does it mean to be lost? Well, right here in this scripture that I read for you guys in Luke chapter 19 verse 10 when Jesus said the son of man has come to seek and to save that which is being lost if you were to take that word that's translated lost in scripture and translate it into, into the, the absolute most contemporary English you could get it into today it literally means this Jesus said I've come to seek and to save what's being wasted what's being wasted and the idea behind that the way that I understand it is this that if you're living this life, the life that was given to you by God who created you in His image because He loved you and wanted to have a relationship with you, sin has marred that relationship. It's made it impossible for you to be in a right relationship with God. It's made it impossible for you to have communion or fellowship with the God that created you. And if you continue to live your life apart from a right relationship with the God that created you, it doesn't matter what you do or where you go, doesn't matter what you accomplish, doesn't matter how much money you make or how many trophies you win or how many trophies you get taxidermied and hung on the wall, doesn't matter what you do, you are wasting your life apart from a right relationship with God which is only found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And so I want to talk to you guys for just a moment tonight about what does it mean to be lost. What does it mean to be lost? And to illustrate it, I just want to go again to the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 15. And in Luke chapter 15, Jesus gives us three pictures there in the way of, of stories and Bible calls parables to tell us what it means for somebody to be lost, to help us have a little deeper understanding. He paints a parable there uh, of a lost sheep and he paints a parable there of a lost coin. And he paints a parable there of a lost son. Three things that have been lost. And he wants us to understand how they got lost. And he wants us to understand what it means in our lives when we're not in the place that we're supposed to be. You see, he 
Lord and Savior of your life. It's impossible for you to be where you're supposed to be if you don't know Jesus. So the first story that Jesus tells, that tells us there was a shepherd and he had a flock of sheep and, and one of them got lost. One of them wandered away and it was lost. And he tells us that the shepherd left the rest of the flock and he went after that that was lost until he found it. Until he found it. And when he found it, he put it on his shoulders and he brought it home and there was much rejoicing because this sheep of his that had been lost was now found. I, I want to tell you, that's an incredible story. And, and there's uh, some incredible truths in there for us to understand because there are a lot of people that are lost today just like the sheep in that story was lost. Do you know why the sheep gets lost? They're always looking for something better. They're always looking for something better. Now, I don't know a whole lot about sheep, but I know a lot about their cousins' goats because I'm a little bit of a goat farmer, too. I don't currently have any stock at my house, but we've had as many as 25 goats in our pasture before and, and, and raised goats down through the years. And I'm going to tell you, if a sheep's half as aggravating as a goat, it's an aggravating animal, you know? A goat, by, number one, a goat is an animal just looking for an excuse to die, really. Anybody ever fooled with goats? I mean, they're just looking for an excuse to die. Mine were anyways. They would pick up every worm and everything coming and going, and it was just constantly something. That's why I don't have any right now. I just don't have time to fool with the things, you know. But every time that it was the most inconvenient to me, the worst part about raising goats, they get out of fence. They get out of the fence. Now, if you come to my house right now, I've got two pasture areas that are about two and a half, three acres. And there is Bermuda in one that's already about, you know, knee high this year. And the other one is between your ankle and your knees with clover. There's plenty in there for those goats to graze on and enjoy, but it was never good enough for mine. They always wanted to see what was on the other side of the fence. And guess what? When they got to the other side of the fence, they tasted it. They didn't stay there very long. They went on to the next spot. And from there to the next spot. And from there to the next spot. Until the next thing you know, I don't have any idea where the goat's at. Now, I'm going to tell you what. I, I was not probably a very good goat farmer. Because I got mad when my goats got out. I did. I was not like the shepherd in the story. My goat got out. It was going to remember that it got out. And I was going to teach it that it really didn't want to get out again. So my goat was usually going to take a little bit of a beating when he got back in the pen. You know, between the place that I got him and the place that I put him back in. Because he was going to remember. But I want to show you in this story. This goat didn't take this, this lamb or sheep. It didn't take a beating. The shepherd lovingly went and found it, put it on his shoulders, and brought it back to the fold. But as I think about that story that Jesus told to illustrate for us what it means to be lost, I can think about so many people that I know that have been just like that sheep that got lost, and I can think of a lot of people that I know who are still like that sheep today. Somewhere along the way, they, they just got bored, you know? They got bored with what they had or with God's provision or they got bored with their place in life. Maybe they got bored uh, in, in their parents' house as a kid. They had a roof over their head and all this stuff and they were always looking for meaning somewhere. And it's not necessarily a nourishment thing. It's a meaning thing most of the time with people. They're looking for meaning and belonging and purpose and fulfillment because they know that there's something that's out of place in their life. And they're trying to find anything that they can numb the pain that comes from not being in a right relationship with the God that created them in His image. And so they go from one thing to another. And I've seen guys, it can be horrible things and it can be simple things. I know some guys that have gone from alcohol to this drug to that drug to the next drug, going everywhere that they can looking for what only God can fix in their life. And I know other guys that have gone from hunting to fishing to mountain biking to this and they pour everything that they have into every activity they can think of not, not because they want to enjoy the outdoors not, not because they want to spend time with their family but because they're trying to find the meaning that can only come from a right relationship with God. And so it can mean just to have a lost sense of direction. That's part of what it means to be lost. You have a lost sense of direction. Years ago, there was a man in this country that was a, an, an avid debater. He was known as the father of the American atheist movement. His name was Robert Ingersoll. 
And, and Robert Ingersoll debated pastors all over this country and taught on the precept that there is no God. One of his first converts to atheism was his mother who had been a Presbyterian woman and raised Ingersoll in church. She left the faith, followed the teachings of her son, and a few years later, she was dying of consumption, tuberculosis. She was lying in her bed in those last days, wheezing for bread. And the story is that Robert Ingersoll came in and he was standing by his mother's bedside. And in her final moments, she was gasping for breath. He said, Mother, hold on, hold on. And that mother opened her eyes and looked at her atheist son. And she said, hold on to what, Robert? You've destroyed anything that I ever had to hold on to. When you destroyed my thoughts of God. Guys, there are a lot of people that are living their lives just that way right now. Some of you may be here tonight and that's where you are in your life right now. What a hopeless place to be. A lost sense of direction. And then Jesus shares with us this story of a lost coin. This, this woman had a coin and there was a purpose for it. And when she went for it, it wasn't there. Now I always think about my grandma Sims for, for real. She was a great cook and she was also a smart woman. They lived at 1102 Woodside Avenue in City View Mill Hill over there in Greenville. I drove my son by the other day on the way back from one of our hiking trips and I said, I want to show you the house that your granddaddy grew up in. We pulled into the median and I was going to let him take a picture in the car. I promised what paused five seconds. I had two different drug dealers coming for me because they thought we were pulling up to make a deal and I had to wave them off and say, guys, just taking a picture of the house my daddy grew up in. And they said, oh, okay, and turned around and went back to the corners, you know. It was a bad section of town. My grandma was a smart woman. She never had a driver's license. She never worked a job, but she was the banker in their family. And I've still got her bank. It was an old sunbeam bread box with folding handles. Anybody remember those? And inside were a lot of different little metal cans, and each can had a purpose. And when my granddaddy worked at Piedmont Shirt Company, brought his check home every week and cashed it, my grandma knew how much went in each can so that she could do what she needed to do. And I've got a little black baking soda can in there that's got a big T scratched on it for the Thanksgiving turkey. She even knew how many cents to take out of my granddaddy's check every week so they could have a turkey at Thanksgiving. And what was left over from the turkey, if anything was, went towards the little meager Christmas that they had in that household when my daddy was growing up. And so I've still got my grandma's bank. And every time I read this parable, I think about that. Every coin had a purpose. Every coin had a place. Every one had a reason. And when one was lost, there's no way it could fulfill its purpose. Something's going to go undone. It's useless if it's not where it belongs. And again, the same thing is true of a lot of people's lives. If we're not in a right relationship with God, we can never fulfill the purpose that God created us for. I had an opportunity to speak at commencement at North Greenville a few years ago for the graduation exercises. Somebody got up and they were talking about all the wonderful opportunities that all these kids had had the whole time they were there. And it was true. They'd had a lot of great opportunities. But I never heard this. I know those kids heard it during their time there. I never heard it on that day of commencement. So when I got up to speak, this is what I said. I said, guys, you've had a lot of incredible opportunities while you've been here. A lot of opportunities to, to give yourselves bright futures. A lot of opportunities to get wonderful educations. A lot of opportunities to make lasting memories for the rest of your life. But I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if you're graduating this school, you've had tons of opportunities to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. And if you walk out the doors of this building today still having rejected Him, still not having trusted Him and received Him and repented of your sins, then you will walk out of this door with a diploma and memories and opportunities like most people will never be able to imagine, but you will be wasting your life. It just simply doesn't matter if you're not in the place that God has for you to be and you can't be in that place apart from a right relationship with Jesus Christ.
Jesus Christ. By the way, guys, that's possible. I'll, I'll just say this. I'm as once saved, always saved, as any Baptist preacher I know. But I want to tell you, in the sense of the coin, it is possible for a born-again believer to be useless to God. If you're not where you're supposed to be in your relationship with God, He cannot use you for the purpose that He has for your life. My granddaddy called those carnal Christians. They, we don't use those words much anymore, but this is the way that he defined it to me when I asked him as a little boy. Papa, what's a carnal Christian? And he said, it's a saved person that lives like they're lost. If you're saved, but you're living like the world, if you're saved, but your friends look at your life and they can't tell the difference between you and every other friend that they have, folks, I want to tell you, you're in a dangerous spot because you could potentially be useless to the purpose that God created you for. You need to be aware of that. Listen. Just, this, I'm, I'm country boy, okay? If, if it waddles like a duck, and it quacks like a duck. And it swims like a duck. Probably a duck. Right? And, and if you live like the world, and look like the world, and act like the world, and nobody can see Jesus, okay, you get where I'm coming from. And then he tells the story of a lost son. That son has a spirit of rebellion. He has a spirit of rebellion. There are a lot of people, there are a lot of people We see it everywhere. Guys, I never thought that I would see people so openly rebel against God that they would try to change the gender that He created them with when He knit them together in their mother's womb. I'm just going to tell you, you, there's not more of a sense of rebellion than that out there today. But you don't have to do that to rebel against God. See, I think there's a backstory there, Brother Stewart, that we never got the fullness of for the sake of time. I think Jesus just started with the son asking for his share of the inheritance, but I, there had to be some backstory. There's a reason that he asked for his share of the inheritance. He's tired of father's rules. He's tired of curfew. He's tired of chores. He's tired of being told what he can and can't do. Can I just do what I want to do when I want to do it? Can I just live my life however I want to live it? I've had Christians ask me that, by the way. Can I just live my life and not worry about what other people think? Well, you can, but you can't be a witness and do that because God's Word says you can't allow anything in that will cause somebody else to stumble. And this boy got tired of that. He got tired of the Father's rules. And he said, Daddy, I want you to give me what I'm going to get when you die. Let's just pretend like you're already dead. Give me my share of inheritance. I'm going. And you guys know the story. I'm not going to keep you all night with this story. He goes to a far country. He wastes all of his father's inheritance on wild women. Wild women. Wild parties. Whatever he could find to do. And he wakes up one day and all of it's gone. And behold, there's a famine in the land. And he doesn't have anything left. And he goes and he hires himself out to a hog farmer. I don't care if he's a Jewish boy or not. You don't, you don't get much worse than slopping hogs regardless of who you are. Right? I mean, I've been there. My father-in-law had a big hog operation in South Georgia. And we were checking it one day and the battery died on his truck downwind end of the hog parlor. And he called his son to come jump him off and I got out of the truck and he said, where are you going? I said, I'm walking back to the house. Ain't no way I'm sitting in that stink. It was July. It smelled so bad. You know, I had to get out of there. And that's where this boy is. He's longing to eat what the hogs are eating. But while he's there, he comes to himself. Listen, there, there are a lot of folks that you know and that I know that need to come to that place of coming to themselves. There's some of you maybe here tonight that need to come to that place of coming to yourself. Of realizing that I've been living a life of rebellion way too long. I, I've been rebelling against God way too long. I've been trying to do it my way and not His way. I'm trying to do
do what I wanted to do and not what he wanted me to do. I've been trying to have it my way and, and, and just do what feels good, what feels right. There was a song on the radio a few years ago that said, if it, if it feels good, it makes you happy, do it, basically. It was the whole idea behind the song. And that seems to be the going orders of the world that we live in today. And a lot of people want to call themselves Christians or want to be part of the church and still live that way, and it's impossible to do that. You have a spirit of rebellion. It takes you away from the place that God wants you to be. We, so this, this is what we did. I, I fought some battles in Lawrence. I started having bass tournaments in Lawrence. And I didn't know any better. I was green. There weren't a whole lot of guys doing that on the church level at the time. I ran a bass tournament like I had seen bass tournaments run, Brother Stewart. We, we had a bass tournament, and it cost $30, $30 a guy, $60 a boat, and there was about a 75% payback to the winners at the end of the tournament. I had some other preachers come and say, man, I really don't like you doing this. I said, well, we're, we're reaching a lot of guys. We had about 50 or 60 guys fishing our, 50 or 60 boats fishing our tournament. And I said, we'll try it another way. And so we tried it without payback, you know, and uh, we had six boats show up and fish our tournament. And then I moved to Greenwood and those guys said, hey, we want to have a bass tournament. And I said, well, I'm not going to do a payback. But God gave me an idea. This was my idea, that we fish for pride instead of money, and I thought I could still get a lot of guys to fish if we did that. So we set up all of the things we do. We have sport and clay tournaments, squirrel sniper tournament. We have golf tournament tomorrow. We, we have bass tournaments, and all of the tournaments at First Mount Moriah are member guest tournaments. And that means this, this two-person team, only one person on the team can be a member of our church. I don't care if nobody on the team is a member of our church. That's fine. They can both be non-members. But no more than one member of our church on the team is what I allow when we do our tournaments. The first year we held a member guest tournament, we had 55 boats fish in that tournament. A lot of guys came to our church for the very first time through that bass tournament. Instantly sparked growth where we were. But we were getting ready for that tournament. I had a pastor friend tell me I grew up squirrel hunting with him. one of the Sprouse boys. Grew up squirrel hunting with him and his son. And I remember thinking as a young boy, there's nothing wrong with my relationship with my daddy, but he was a bookworm and a woodcarver, an artist. He didn't care anything about hunting and fishing. He made sure somebody from church took me when I wanted to go, or when I had an opportunity to go, and it was convenient for them, but he never did that. And I always remember looking at, the, at, at, at Stanley and Shannon and thinking, man, they got something special. They do this together all the time. And, and when I was a kid, I just kind of thought that was cool. Well, Stanley called me. And he said, I heard about this bass tournament you're having at your church. And I said, yeah. And he said, would you see if one of your men will ask Shannon to fish? And I said, that's fine, Stanley. I said, but you can fish with Shannon. Nobody has to be a member of First Mount Moriah. Neither one of y'all can fish together. And he said, no, we can't. And I said, well, sure you can. And he said, no, you don't understand. He said, I haven't talked to Shannon in four years. Four years. They were as close as any father and son I'd ever met in my life. They'd not spoken in four years. He said, in my living room right now are Christmas presents for him and his wife and his little girl for four years. Every year we go buy them a Christmas present. It's stacked up over here in the corner. It's right We're just waiting for the day when he'll come home. And I can give him these presents. So I said, I think I know the guy. And I went and talked to a guy in my church and I said, I want you to call Shannon and ask him to, to fish this tournament with you. The next day he called him and took him to lunch and he said they sat down for, for lunch and Shannon looked across the table and said, did my daddy send you? And he said, no, his daddy didn't send him. I sent him. I sent him. He said, no, why? What's, what's going on there? He told him everything. The next day, Stanley's pastor in our association was visiting the hospital, and I saw him on my way in. I hollered across the parking lot. I said, hey, wait up. And I got over there, and I said, I've got some good news for you. He said, no, you don't. And I said, no, I, I really do have some good news for you. And he said, no, you don't. And I 
said, no, I have really good news. Your son's going to fish the tournament with the guy I told him to. He said, you don't have to tell me that. And I said, why not? He said, tears begin to flow. We had Christmas at our house last night. Amen. We had Christmas at our house last night. His son came home and made amends. His son's a leader worker in that church today serving the Lord back in a right relationship with his father. And the gifts were given and they were open and they were received. Listen, what, what does it mean to be lost? Well, it means to not be where you're supposed to be. It means to have a lost sense of direction. It means to have a sense of a spirit of rebellion in your life. And if you continue to live your life that way, you'll end up living to yourself and for yourself. And guys and ladies, eventually by yourself. That's the results of being lost. But there is another side to that story. Because when that boy got home, it was just like Shannon going home. The father saw him while he was still a long ways off. And he ran to the boy. The boy had been working up a speech. He was going to say, Daddy, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. And I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Would you just make me like one of your servants and I'll live out in the servants' quarters and eat what they eat and I won't call you daddy anymore and I won't have any claims to be in your child. If, if you would just make sure that I have food to eat and shelter over my head, everything be okay. He didn't even get to give the speech that he had practiced all the way home. Because his daddy put his arms around him. And he kissed him. And he said, bring a robe and put it on him. Bring a ring and put it on his finger. Bring sandals and put it on his feet. And kill the fatted calf. We're going to have a party. Because my son, who was lost, is found. And guys, that's what's waiting for every person that will come back to a right relationship with the Lord. There, there are a couple things I want to share with you in closing. The first one is this. There's, there's something that doesn't get preached enough today that's an important part of this parable. And that is the first step to being back in a right relationship with the Father is repentance. Is repentance. That's a word that just doesn't get preached enough anymore. Listen. This is what repentance looks like in the story of the prodigal son. He left the far country and went home. If he had stayed in the far country, he never would have been in a right relationship with his father. He could have believed his father would have forgiven him. He could have believed his father would feed him. He could have believed his father would give him the robe and the ring and the sandals and kill the fatted calf, but he'd still been sitting longing to fill his stomach with the pods the pigs were eating until he got up and turned from where he had been and started walking back in the direction that God wanted him to be in. The same thing's true for us today, guys. You can't say, Jesus, forgive me of my sin, but I'm going to keep on doing what I've been doing and be right with God. It's got to begin with repentance. You've got to turn and start back home. Listen, when you start back home, the forgiveness is already there. It's a beautiful part of that story. When did the father forgive the son? I think he forgave him the day he left because he was looking for him, longing for him, looking down the road. Listen, the story says, while he was still a long way off, he didn't have binoculars, he didn't have a spotting scope, he's looking, waiting every day for that boy to come back. And when the boy comes back, the forgiveness is already there. Listen to me, you, you can't forgive yourself, you can't earn God's forgiveness, you can't deserve God's forgiveness, it's already there. Romans 5, 8 says God demonstrated His love towards us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Everything that was necessary, the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ has already been paid for us. All we've got to do is repent and turn in faith and start back towards where the Father is. If you're here tonight and you're not where you belong, you've got a lost sense of direction, you've had a spirit of rebellion, if you'll just stand and turn your back on all of that, turn back towards the Lord Jesus Christ and the God that created you in His image. He's standing with His arms open wide, waiting to receive you and welcome you 
you home. I want to ask you if you'd do this for me tonight. If you just for a moment, every head bowed, every eye closed in this place. Nobody's looking around except for me so that I can pray for you tonight. If you're here tonight and you understand what it means to be lost because you're there right now. Would you just raise your hand so I can pray for you? If you're here tonight and you know that you're lost, thank you for that. I want to be able to pray for you tonight. I want you to know this tonight, that all you have to do is turn from living for yourself to yourself. Turn back to the Lord and ask Him tonight to forgive you and He'll do that. And I'm going to pray. You just pray silently where you are along with me. This prayer doesn't save you. But it reveals your heart to a God that can save you. I just want you to say this tonight where you are silently. Lord, be, be merciful to me, a sinner. I'm not where I should be. I'm not right with you and I want to be. God, give me the strength to turn from the far country. To come back to a Father who loves me. Who gave His Son Jesus to save me. Lord, thank You for forgiving me my sins. Thank You for making of me a new creation. Thank You for the opportunity to be Your Son. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Just look back up here for just one more minute. Guys, there's another application that I want to give you real quick. I was preaching this the other night and what does it mean to be lost? I was in uh, Aiken, South Carolina. Sweetwater Baptist Church for their wild game dinner. and God just showed me something brand new I'd never seen in His parables before. Brother, and, and I think it's an application that's important for us today. We, we had three things that were lost, right? A, a sheep and a coin and a boy. Guys, it's really really broke my heart. This is for Christians in the room tonight, okay? If you're here and you know the Lord, you're not lost, you're in a right relationship with Him, I think this is to help us make sure that our priorities are right. Two, two of those parables involved material possessions that were lost. One of those parables involved a young man created in the image of God that was lost. In two of those parables, people went looking for things that were lost. Sheep and the coin. Nobody went looking for that boy. Nobody went looking for him. There hadn't been a famine in the land. He hadn't come to the end of his resources. He hadn't longed to eat the hog slop. I don't know that he ever would have come home. Because nobody went looking for him. Guys, we need to understand what it means to be lost. It's a hopeless, helpless condition. You know, I've just kind of come to this conclusion that I talked with these other pastors, they didn't know what it meant to be lost. I've kind of come to this conclusion that I get mad at the world and the things that are going on in it and shake my fist at it and holler at it. Or I can look at it like Jesus did. It says he looked at the multitudes. He had pity on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And I know this, that when I was lost, Jesus said, I've come to seek and to save that which was lost. And as far as I understand, there's two common purposes that we all have as children of God. One is to bring glory to God. And the second is to take the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ to those that are lost. Maybe you're here tonight and God's laid on your heart somebody that's lost. As I preach this message, you know somebody who's lost their sense of direction. You know 
somebody that's not where they belong. Maybe you've noticed it the last two or three Sundays or the last month or two, whether you worship here or somewhere else, you just know there's somebody that's not in their place. Maybe it's somebody with a spirit of rebellion. God's laid them on your heart tonight to go after that one that's lost. Don't neglect that. Don't say this is a game dinner and and maybe somebody got saved tonight and and that's the only thing that needs to happen. No, it's a great thing that needs to happen. Somebody signified tonight that they needed to do that and I hope that they did. But we all need to take seriously the role that we have to play in that as well. Your church has launched the Who's Your One campaign. Maybe tonight you need to write that name that God's laid down on your heart on your Who's Your One card. If you don't have one yet, they're down here on the communion table. You can get one before you leave. It's a card for you to write their name and there's a bookmark for you to write and gives you scripture how to pray for 30 days. You catch up on the first four days now and you have 30 days before Easter if you read five tomorrow and then start from there. It'll take you right on through Easter praying for that person. And Easter is a wonderful opportunity for you to invite somebody that's lost to go to church with you. So can I encourage you not to have your priorities in the wrong place? Guys, we chase after, don't we, those material things. The sheep and the coins. The trophies and the money. Let us not do it and forget the most important thing, the thing that's eternal. That boy created in the image of God. So you've got your card with you tonight. and There's a couple of options there for you to fill out tonight. and Maybe you need to fill one of these out. Uh, the first one is, I am a member of Blue Ridge View Baptist Church. And hopefully if you are, you've already checked that. Or if you're a visitor, you've let them know that. The next one is, today I accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of my life. And if you're here tonight and you prayed that prayer with me just a moment ago, I want you to check that box. Nobody's going to bother you but this preacher. He just wants to be able to follow up and make sure that he meets whatever need that you have. If you need more information about how to live for Jesus or walk with Him on a regular basis, then He's going to make sure that you have that. And He's not going to call you out in front of anybody or anything like that. That's why we put it on this card for you here tonight. Maybe you're here and you say, I want to know more about becoming a Christian. You're, you're just not quite ready yet, but you want to have a, a, a deeper conversation about it than's possible tonight. You check that box. Maybe you're here and you're a believer though and you needed to rededicate your life to the Lord tonight. You know, we talk about that a lot, right? Rededication. I said the word that we don't like to say sometimes just a little while ago. You know what that is, rededication? It's repentance. It's repentance. And maybe you're here tonight and You've been useless to God because you've not been where you ought to be because you've not been living like a child of God. You've been living like the world. And you just need to repent. Then you check that box that says, I want to rededicate my life tonight. Or maybe you're here tonight and you understand that you've had your priorities out of place because you've been chasing things that don't matter instead of chasing things that are eternal. And tonight you're going to dedicate yourself to go after that one that's lost and you need to check tonight, I want to rededicate my life. If there's any other decision or prayer request you want to know about membership in this church, anything you want to tell them, you fill them out on that card before they take them up in just a minute. I'm going to pray with you one more time. If you're here tonight and you're a believer and you just need to repent, guys, not a dirty word. It's not a dirty word. Martin Luther, the, the, the father of the Reformation, said that he learned that he needed to repent on a daily basis. I pastor the church I've been pastoring for 15 years. And there are people that have never darkened the altar of that church in 15 years. And Martin Luther said he needed to repent daily. There's nothing wrong with with rededicating, repenting, getting right with God. And that's what you need to do tonight. I want to pray for you and then I'm going to turn it back over to Pastor Stewart. Father, just thank you again for this opportunity to be at this great church with this great man of God who is their pastor. Father, I thank you for being with us in this place tonight. I thank you for what you've done in hearts and lives in this place tonight. And Lord, I just pray that as we draw to the close of this service and the fellowship continues, Lord, that you would continue to speak to us and continue to challenge us tonight. Father, if anybody just needs to turn tonight, they already know you, Lord. They've already been saved by the, by the miracle of your grace in Jesus Christ. But tonight, Lord, they just say, Lord, I just need to turn back. I just need to
determined I'm not in the far country, but I'm standing in the direction facing where it is. And I just need to turn back to the Father tonight. Lord, just give them the courage to make that decision and give them the power and the fullness of your Holy Spirit to live that decision out on a daily basis. Lord, we'll give you the glory for what you'll do through those acts of rededication and repentance tonight. And Lord, we'll give you the glory for what you do in the life of the one that's hopelessly lost tonight. Hopefully they've already turned to you, but if not, before they leave this place tonight, that they would trust Jesus Christ and claim him as Lord and Savior of their life. Lord, we thank you for Jesus. He's the reason that we're here tonight. And we ask all of these things in his name and for his glory. Amen.